Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Matthew chapter 12. At that particular time, Jesus went through the fields of standing grain on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pick off the spikes of grain and to eat it. So now everybody here in Jesus in Matthew is breaking the law, and none of them are guilty. <laughs> Verse 6. Let me see how many verses I want to read you. Okay. But I tell you something greater and more exalted and more majestic than the temple is here. And if you had only known what this saying means, I desire mercy, readiness to help, to spare, and to forgive, rather than sacrifice and sacrificial victims, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now let, let's just stop there. What, what in the world does he mean by that? He means when you do something wrong, I don't want your sacrifice. That's old covenant. We've had the only sacrifice that will ever be needed, Jesus Christ. No more sacrifice will ever be needed now. Now we get to give the sacrifice of praise, hallelujah. We get to lift up our voices and worship God. And that's the only sacrifice that he wants. He said, I don't want your sacrifices. I'd rather forgive you, spare you, show you mercy. But you have to learn how to receive it. So here's what happens when we do something wrong. We don't have to sacrifice. And one of the things that I sacrificed was my joy. I just wouldn't let myself enjoy anything. That was one of the ways that I punished myself. And I frankly think that's one of the ways that we all punish ourselves. Well, I wasn't good, so I don't get to enjoy anything. I don't get to enjoy life because I acted bad today. I fell in the ditch one more time. God says, no, I'd much rather give you mercy. I don't want you to sacrifice your joy. I want you to receive my mercy. I want you to receive my forgiveness. I want to spare you. I want to be good to you even though you don't deserve it. Now, don't misunderstand me. This does not mean that God won't deal with us. This does not mean that God won't chastise us. This does not mean that we're just going to live sloppy, sinful lives and get by with it. Let me tell you something. God will deal with us. But I'm believing that I'm talking to people that love God, that want to do what's right, and I'm trying to help you understand that unless you get rid of the guilt and condemnation in your life, you are never going to make progress. So we are always going to fall in the ditch from time to time. And Jesus will come and get us out just like he got the donkey out of the ditch here in the Bible. And he will help us make progress to the next ditch we fall in. Then he'll get us out again and we'll make some more progress. Are you understanding what I'm saying tonight? For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And going on from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, a man was there with a withered hand. And they said, Is it lawful or allowable to cure people on the Sabbath day? And they said it that they might accuse him. <laughs> but he said to them, What man is there among you if he has only one sheep and it falls into a pit or a ditch on the Sabbath? Will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much better and of more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful and allowable to do good on the Sabbath day. And he told the man, reach out your hand, and he cured the man. So Jesus is trying to say to these people, look, if your dumb donkey or your dumb sheep, because they were all herders and farmers, if your sheep falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you are going to go get it out. And surely these people that I love this much are worth more than a donkey or a sheep. And I don't care what day it is. I don't care if it's legal or not. When they need help, I'm going to help them. So good. So good. Now, so when you've been bad, don't withdraw and not ask God to help you. Come boldly to the throne and say, God, I, I, just, I know I don't deserve this. I'm so sorry for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. And I pray, Lord, that you would change me and help me not to do this again. But I'm so grateful that I can just come boldly to the throne and have you meet my needs. I need some help. God, will you help me? 
We don't withdraw. We come boldly to the throne. And that makes the devil mad. Now, an example that God gave me that really helped me understand this. Our, our youngest son, who's now 32, was, I guess, about 10 when God began to teach me these things. And so that means that this has been a good 22 years ago. And uh, his name is Dan. And of course, we called him Danny. I still do, but now he's officially Daniel. And um, he wasn't a very disciplined child. He just loved to have fun and real sanguine, happy-go-lucky, zippity-doo-dah personality, you know. And uh, so we, we tried to give him these little guidelines to follow, some little chores that we wanted him to do around the house, trying to teach him some things. And so he couldn't remember them, so we finally wrote them down for him. And we did this system. You do it, you get a check mark on Monday. If you do it all, you get a check mark on Tuesday. You know, you get enough check marks and you know, then you'll get a special prize. And so it was a big deal every day to check the chart to see if he'd done everything he's supposed to do. Make the bed, feed the dog, do this, do that, do something else. You know, just five or six little things. Well, he loved to play, and so he played outside a lot. And there was a bully in the neighborhood. We'll say the bully represents the devil. And uh, he loved to take Danny's ball and throw it down the sewer. And any time that he would do that, or he'd get after Danny. We had, a, we, we had a garage here on this side of the house that came into the kitchen and then our family room was right here beside of it. Well, when the kids were out playing, we'd keep the garage doors up all the time and they would come in and out of the garage. So many times, Dave and I would be sitting here in the family room and we'd hear Danny come screaming, Daddy! Well, we knew the bully was after him. And I have seen Dave almost tear the door up. Get out there to help his son. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, what kind of a parent would you be if when you heard your son screaming for help, if Dave would have said, Joyce, I hear our son screaming for help. He must be in trouble. Would you go downstairs and check his chart and see if he got all of his check marks? Come on. <laughs> and if he got all of his check marks, I'll help him. If not, too bad for him. Well, of course we wouldn't do that. Why? Because he's our child and we love him and we're committed to him. You know something God showed me a few weeks ago that just tickled me no end. Are you ready for this? How many of you know that you're going to sin some more in your life? <laughs> okay, how many of you, you don't want to, nobody wants to, right? We don't want to, but we know that we will because we still have weaknesses. That's why we need Jesus. We get up every day and we want to do the best that we can, but we get in the ditch sometimes. And, um, but in order to have relationship with us, now get this, in order for me to have a relationship with Dave, I already know after 45 years of marriage that there will be other times in life when Dave's going to disappoint me or hurt my feelings. He's not going to do it on purpose because he loves me, but, you know, we're people. And so, you know, I mean, things happen. Like, normally in the afternoons, like when we, we take a nap, especially on Friday because we got the two meetings, and so we'll take a little nap or take a rest, and and so I'll always go in and knock on Dave's door about 30 minutes before time. Are you up? And he's always up, always, always, always up. Yes, I'm up, I'm up. Okay, he's got his own alarm clock. So tonight, today I didn't go, I forgot about him. And so it was like 10 minutes before we're gonna leave. And I thought, I better see if Dave's up. So I went in, he wasn't up. Oh my gosh, why didn't you wake me up? I said, why am I responsible to get you out of bed? It is not my fault. You've got an alarm clock sitting right there. Well, you know. But see what? Just like that, even though he kind of sort of blamed me for not getting him up, I just forgot about that and went right on. He does that same thing for me all the time. You know, I'll get a little snippy or, you know, he forgives me. So if we're going to stay married, which we are, and if we're going to stay in relationship, then literally we have both already decided 
that whatever we do in the future, we've already decided to forgive each other. You can't have relationship if you don't make that decision. And guess what? God already knows every mistake you will ever make, and He has already decided to forgive you. You're not even in the ditch yet, and He's decided to get you out. Oh my gosh, this is so good, I can't hardly take it. I mean, you're not even in the ditch yet, and He's already got you out. And you know what that does for me? Just takes all the pressure off. God is not even a little, even a little bit shocked by you. You know why? And I love to say this. He knew what he was getting when he got you. And he knew what he was getting when he got me. And he loves us anyway. Oh, my, my, my. Jesus doesn't love us because we're perfect. He loves us because he wants to. Matthew 12, 20 says, a bruised reed he will not break. I love that. That's so great. Another scripture says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Even if you still just got a little bit of spark in you, God will work with you. If you're a bruised reed and you're a little, you know, got some pain in your life, you don't have to worry. You can always come to Jesus because He'll always be gentle with you. He'll always help you. He'll never put more on you than what you can bear. When people load you down with rules and regulations, they need to leave you alone. I, you know, can you imagine some broken-hearted person who's been abused and mistreated all their life, and maybe a woman who's gotten into prostitution because of the way she was raised, and maybe gotten on drugs, and now she's a mess, and I don't know, maybe she... Let's just make up something. She watched my TV program, gave her life to the Lord, and I'm telling her, go find a good local church. Now, what if she goes and finds a church somewhere, and the only thing they can think up to tell her is that she needs to clean up and do this and change her hairstyle and change something else? You know, we need to learn how to love people where they're at and let God help them get to where they need to be. Amen. You know, a lot of churches sit around and cry about wanting revival. They're no more ready for a revival than a man in the moon. Because you know why? The people that come in during revival don't all act nice, look nice, smell nice, or behave like the religious people do. Amen? A preacher friend of ours in England, Paul Scanlon, he tells some of the funniest stories. And he's a guy who just really has learned how to love everybody. And they're really in the midst of revival and having a real move of God. And this lady <laughs> out in the prayer line one night, and, and he was praying for people. And some of them were really being touched by the power of God, and she'd never felt anything like that. And so he touches her, and she says, What the blankety blank blank was that? <laughs> And he's thinking, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so next time he was getting ready to pray for people, she got up there again. He's thinking, oh, no, not her again, please. <laughs> she did it again. Oh, there the blankety-blank thing is again. <laughs> and you know what? You, you can just see, the, well, bless God, I'm not going to stay in this church if the preacher's going to let people talk like that. <laughs> Please give God a little bit of time to work with people before you decide to throw them out. Just give them a little bit of time to work with people. I'll tell you another funny story. How many of you know Chris Kane? Anybody here know who Chris Kane is? Okay. Well, she's a, actually a really good friend of mine, and I've had the privilege of mentoring her a lot over the years in her ministry, and her and I were shopping one day in Phoenix, and we went into this store, and um, a girl was in there, and 
she was asked what we were doing there, and we said, well, we're here for Christian conference. She said, oh, yes, I'm spiritual too. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> yes, I'm spiritual. What does that mean? Well, so as she's talking, she's using pretty bad language. Now, this is the clerk in the store. And uh, pretty soon, she, she drops this F-bomb, and I'm like, I, I, I just really don't like bad language. My father had a filthy mouth, and I have a particular aversion to bad language. So I'm thinking. So Chris is just trying to minister to her because, you know, she's a real evangelism and so, uh, an evangelist. And so pretty soon the girl says, oh, I'm so sorry about my language. She said, you know, I think God understands. She said, I even think that God probably cusses sometimes. <laughs> well, I lean over the counter and I said, God does not cuss. I mean, I, whatever little bit of religion I had left in me, it came to life. I said, God does not cuss. Well, here's Chris, and she leans right in beside me, and she said, but he sure loves people who do. <laughs> and later I realized what I was doing. She was trying to catch a fish, and I was trying to clean it before we ever caught it. Well, see, that's what we do a lot of times, you know. We won't even give people enough time for God to develop a relationship with them, and we're trying to clean them up and make them act like we think they ought to be act to be part of our group. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. If you know a donkey that's in the ditch, instead of judging it for being in the ditch, why don't you just go try to help it get out? Wow, you dumb donkey, you why, you, why are you in that ditch again? I've told you to stay out of that ditch. They already know they shouldn't be in the ditch. They already feel bad about being in the ditch. Why don't you just help them get out of the ditch? But no, what do we do? We shovel dirt on them. Try to bury them so they stay in the ditch. Jesus is a lifter. He's our glory and the lifter. Psalm 107.20 says, He sends His word and heals them and lifts them out of the pit. Heals them from destruction. I love it. Now, if you've studied the Bible much, you know about this thing in Romans 7 where Paul says, I do not know what my problem is. The thing I don't want to do, I keep doing. The thing I want to do, I can't do. What is my problem anyway? Well, we all have been there, right? And I don't have time to read the whole thing, but he gets over to Romans 7, verse 24, and he says, Oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? Oh, and you have to see the way it's written in the Amplified. Look on the screen. Oh, thank God, exclamation mark. He will. <laughs> Through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, our Lord. I love that. Who's going to deliver me? Oh, thank God. He will. Through Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1. So there is therefore now, while I'm waiting for God to do this work in me, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And that's not talking about, I used to look at that and think, well, duh. If I could walk after the Spirit and not the flesh, then there would be no reason to be condemned. I didn't understand it. But I really believe that what he's talking about there is that when you do sin or when I sin, we can either follow the flesh to get over it or we can follow the Spirit to get over it. And if I follow the flesh to get over my sin, then I have to try to work my way out. I have to earn and deserve my forgiveness. But if I follow the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, I ask God to forgive me, I receive that forgiveness, I shake off the guilt, and I move on to the next thing that God has for me. And I can tell you that the way I'm preaching this weekend is not going to make you sin more. It's not going to make you think that you have a license to sin, and now you can get by with living a sloppy life. What it's going to do for you is make you fall so much more in love with Jesus that you are going to want more than ever to please Him. And by the time you get out of here tomorrow, you're going to find out that God will change you, 
If you stop trying to change yourself, and if you learn how to let God be God in your life. You don't have to stay a donkey, you can become an eagle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. But as long as we keep trying to do it ourselves, we'll always just remain a donkey in the ditch. I used to spend most of my life in the ditch. Now, thank God, I only get in it once in a while. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you do something wrong, the devil says, you dumb donkey. Why are you in that ditch? And the answer should be, well, duh, because I'm a dumb donkey. <laughs> but let me remind you that I am God's donkey. And he will lift me out. Amen. Now, okay, well, when the religious demons are coming after me, the Pharisees, the people that like to judge and criticize, and the ones who always like to tell me that I should be further along than where I'm at. I remember my son, when I first started preaching in the church that we were in, they had a school there, and he went to school there. And I'm telling you what, the, the things that people say to kids sometimes, you just, you just like to slap them. And people put so much pressure on him because he was my son. And I remember asking him one time, what was one of the hardest things for you growing up? And he thought for a long time, and he said, just the, the, the expectations that people had of me because I was your son. Like, child A could do something wrong, and nobody thought that much about it. But if my, one of my kids did something wrong, well, <laughs> I certainly would have expected more out of you. After all, you're Joyce Meyer's son. Well, see, you can internalize that stuff. And you know what? A lot of preacher's kids go through this. I mean, you'll find a lot of preacher's kids that go through this same thing. Why is it that we expect more out of everybody else than what we're able to produce ourselves? Let people be people and give God an opportunity to work in their life. Amen? So we got to learn how when people come against us like that, when the devil's coming against us, we got to learn how to shake it off and trust God to work it out for our good. I will not let somebody else condemn me anymore and make me feel guilty because I'm not what they think I ought to be. Amen? Even if I got a complaint about this message, let's just say that somebody wrote me and said, I don't think you should talk about dog poo in the pulpit. <laughs> I, I, you know what I'm going to do with that? Shake it off. You know why? Because I'm not going to be led by the crowd. I'm going to be led by God. All right, now, let me tell you a story about a donkey. Well, one day a farmer's donkey fell into a well. And the animal cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out what he ought to do about the donkey that was in the ditch. And finally he said, well, this animal's old and the well needs to be covered up anyway, so it's not really worth trying to get this donkey out of the ditch. So he invited all of his neighbors to come over and help him, and they all grabbed a shovel and began to shovel dirt into the well on top of the donkey. And you know, sadly, sometimes when you are the donkey in the ditch, your friends will try to shovel dirt on you instead of helping you get out. Some of you got that, right? They all grabbed a shovel and began to shovel dirt down into the well. And at first, the donkey, when he realized what was happening, cried horribly. <laughs> then to everyone's amazement, he quieted down. They thought, well, he'd probably just given up. A few shovels later, the farmer looked down the well and was astonished at what he saw. With every double shovel of dirt that hit his back, the donkey was doing something amazing. He would shake it off and get up on top of it. <laughs> Here would come another shovel, shake it off, get up on top of it again. More dirt, shake it off, 
get up on top of it again. Pretty soon that donkey walked right out of that well. You know, sometimes we're going along in life and all of a sudden we just feel like we fell off into a ditch somewhere. We've got a problem that we don't know how to solve. And you know, Jesus is the one who comes and lifts us up. We need to start showing the same mercy toward others that Jesus shows toward us. We need to reach out a helping hand to people. It always enriches our lives when we help others. Well, as you can see, I'm holding twins, and they are one month old, but they are severely malnourished. And actually, I've just been told that there's hope for them, but we have to be able to feed the mother so she can allow them to nurse as well as feed the babies. There were twins here yesterday, but one of them had, all, had, had uh, died because of malnourishment. But we can save these, and you're helping us do that. They are so sweet, but they are so tiny, so tiny. Thank you so much for helping us make a difference in the lives of these people here in Ethiopia.